This morning, it's our privilege to welcome to our pulpit Bishop Charles N. Crutchfield. Uh, Bishop Crutchfield uh, was born in liberal Kansas. And as you hear, you'll hear later in his sermon, he graduated from high school in Oklahoma City, and then went to SMU, that's where he had his undergraduate degree, and then to Duke University. He did postgraduate studies at Edinburgh University in Scotland. He went back and was ordained and joined the New Mexico Conference. That was in 1969. And during his years of pastorate in that conference, there were some connections with people from Central. I see the Zurichs here that I believe were in his church in uh, El Paso. I enjoyed those years. Um, in 2004, uh, Bishop Crutchfield was elected to the Episcopacy. He became a part of our Council of Bishops, one of our Episcopal leaders, and he served the Arkansas area from 2004 to 2012. If you spend some time in his resume, you're, you're going to see a legacy of leadership, someone that helped navigate Methodism into the 21st century. Um, he worked with the larger issues of what it means to be a Christian in this day and age, and it, you can truly say he was a global leader. Uh, we, were, we received with glad heart the news not so long ago that um, Bishop Crutchfield and Karen were going to choose Asheville to retire at. And then our gladness grew when we found out that they were going to associate themselves here at Central. One thing I have come to know about Bishop Crutchfield in our, our brief time we've been together is that he has a real passion for the local church, a devotion for the very thing that we're doing here today, that we seek to do week after week, being a local church in this community. It wasn't long ago, uh, a few weeks ago, that the confirmation class was going to have a particular day of study, and Bishop Crutchfield said, I will be there. And he spent an afternoon with our confirmands. That's the kind of love he has for what we're trying to do here in this church. Uh, we're so grateful that the Crutchfields are among us. Um, Bishop, we welcome you to our pulpit today. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know who he was. Jesus said to him, to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. The disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked, and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breaking bread and breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. A second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said, follow me. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to say what a privilege it is for me to be here with you today. And uh, I have two things. One is that um, I really appreciated the singing of the youth choir this morning, both in the early service when they sang alone and then now joining with the chancel choir, uh, and particularly the, the song during the offertory. Uh, as a bishop, it has been my privilege to do some traveling in the world and elsewhere, and one of the places that we spent some time was Africa. And one of the things that we noticed in Africa was when the offering was taken, incidentally, they don't discreetly pass the plate to the front of the church and put your offering in a large bowl or basket or pot of some sort. So everybody sees what you're doing. But the ones who came forward with the most joy and the most happiness and always in the song were the youth. And it was so appropriate to hear them singing the offertory today and praise the Lord. The other thing I need to say, uh, want to say, is that as a bishop, it's been my privilege to hear lots of people preach. And I just need to say to you this morning how blessed I have been and how blessed you are with the pulpit in this church. You have one of the outstanding preachers in all of Methodism as your pastor. And I, I, I don't know how many times I have been intrigued and challenged and uh, brought to conviction, really, by what Dr. Blackburn has had to share with us. Uh, I needed to say that I'm just, I'm envious of the fact that many of you have been here. Someone said to me this morning, I've been a member of this church over 40 years and been listening to good preaching, but I know that since, uh, what was it, 1999, 1996, something like, something like that, you've been hearing the best there is. So it's a privilege to be in this pulpit today. Let us bow our heads for a moment of quiet preparation. Amen. It was really perfect. Just as I drove into the parking lot of the country club where the class reunion was to be held. On the radio, there came one of my favorite R&B anthems. It was Gladys Knight and the Pips, 
And I understand she has some local roots here. But they were singing. He kept dreaming that someday he'd be a star. But he sure found out the hard way. Dreams don't always come true. So he pawned all his hopes. He even sold his old car. Bought a one-way ticket back to the life he once knew. Oh, yes, he did. He said he would. He's leaving on that midnight train to Georgia. Going back to find simpler place and time. Well, Gladys is not going to have to worry about me competing with her for singing, but um, <laughs> that song ought to be the anthem or the theme song for every class reunion because that's what we wanted to do. go back to a simpler place and time. The fifth reunion of Tulsa Central High School's class of 1961 uh, found that the talk was all about college and marriage and uh, the Peace Corps and oh and we remembered the the class play Anastasia boy we knocked them dead with that and 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 the class musical Brigadoon oh I'm still humming the tunes and we remembered we rehearsed again and again the night that a small under undermanned squad of central braves took the finest basketball team in the history of the state of Oklahoma on their home court to three, count them, one, two, three overtimes and won the game 43 to 41 on short Harry Bailey's last second shot. I really like the short part. <laughs> At the 25th reunion, the talk was of kids in college, a few second marriages, who was working in New York or London or Dallas, who had made a million and uh, who had lost a million and a half. Uh, whatever happened to? And where is she now? And then we remembered that undermanned squad of central braves coached by the now famous coach Eddie Sutton, who by that time had won a national championship or two, who took the finest basketball team in the history of the Southwest <laughs> to three overtimes, or, or, or was it four? and won the game on short little Harry Bailey's last second shot. Both of these, both of these reunions and the others that I've been to have been about nights to remember. A time so innocent, so uncomplicated, so right, so good, so simple, so pure. There are simply places that we yearn to return, far away from the fractious problems of recession and war and health care debates, and places of the heart, places that are full of dreams and memories and sweet nostalgia, places to which we can retreat in our pain in order to relive our joy, places we go when our dreams have been smashed, but places where innocent hope prevails. Places far away from the screaming headlines of political incivility and terrorism in Paris and Brussels and Islamabad and San Bernardino. Places where the cast and the props are just right where emotions are strong and love was born and parting is still such a sweet, exquisite sorrow, where dawn skies are lit with the promises and every sunset is a master artist's triumph. Going back to find 
a simpler place and time. On the shores of the great inland sea we call Galilee, the last scene is about to be played out where the first scene was played. Here is Peter back in his boat, back at his old uncomplicated occupation. Here is the one who one day rose up to follow Jesus, but now brokenhearted with a shattered life is back in his old haunts to the place that would bring him comfort and a memory of simpler, gentler times. The adventure, the Christ adventure, at least for him, appears to be over. Peter must be thinking, he might be raised, but for me, the dream is ended. I had my chance. It vanished in my denial of our friendship. I, I was the one who would be stalwart, who would be there to the very end. I cut and ran. I'm not fit to be a part of anybody's kingdom, much less his. The others must have felt very much the same because the majority of the disciples were back there with Peter out on that boat fishing to no avail. But they were back doing something they knew, back to a simpler place and time. Their return hadn't been very auspicious, of course. As I said, they hadn't caught anything. And Peter, I suppose, might have been thinking of another time on the lake uh, recorded in the Gospels when they'd cast their nets after not having caught any fish because a man on the shore said, cast your nets someplace else. And they did, and they caught more than they could hauled ashore. Well, all of a sudden, in the midst of that reverie, John, the beloved disciple, is shaking Peter and saying, look, look, on the shore, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, and he's telling us where to cast our nets again. Peter shaded his eyes. Can't you see it? He shaded his eyes, and sure enough, there is the familiar figure walking back and forth, pointing out where to cast the nets. Peter must have been filled with cascading thoughts, but one surely must have been, is it starting all over again? The next hour would be for Peter worth a lifetime. Leaping into the water, encountering Jesus on the shore, uh, having a meal by the side of the little charcoal fire, and then finding himself alone with Jesus as they walked. I can see this. And Jesus turns to Simon Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's only a brief scrap of dialogue, but three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? This question, those words, are the great simplification of the Christian faith. Jesus did not say to Simon Peter, Simon, are you sure of the hermeneutical principles on which you will base the exegesis of my words? Are you properly attuned to the eschatological and soteriological and axiological realities that confront you in your present ontological condition? And are you fully aware of the contextual complexities of the divine human symbiosis? And can you spell any of those words anyway? He simply said, cut right to the heart. Simon, Peter, do you love me? You see, the gospel doesn't give us a problem. It gives us a person. The gospel doesn't give us an ism or an ology, but the word made flesh. The gospel doesn't give us 
a system of metaphysics, but a master passion, a living word to love and be loved forever. The poet G.K. Chesterton said, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. Peter, do you love me? That simple question represents the dynamic blending of Christ's redeeming love and patience that pursued Peter to the shores of the Sea of Galilee, back to that simpler place and time. That redeeming love and patience tracked Peter down in the dawning of a new morning to bring the ruins of a broken heart a healing touch and new life. Have you ever felt like Peter must have felt? No one could possibly love me for what I've done and for who I've been and for how I've acted. Well, that's Peter's cry and I suspect it's our cry too from time to time. But Jesus did. He loved Peter enough to pursue him. And this question, which is the fundamental question of the Christian faith, saved Peter from the self-destruction of despair and guilt and self-doubt and sin. Today, Jesus continues to come over the horizon and say to us, pursuing us wherever we may be, do you love me? In response, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Now, he, Peter is getting a little bit upset about this because he's been asked the question three times. Is Jesus not getting it? Well, Jesus does get it. And I think it may be because Peter himself doesn't have much to stand on. I mean, how can Peter say, oh, yeah, man, you know, I'm your man, given all that he's done? He had played the coward. His record of loyalty was besmirched with dishonor. He had nothing to appeal to except the understanding heart of Jesus. Lord, you know everything. You know the whole colossal story of my shame. This moment now, however, becomes for Peter nothing short of the opening of a struggling soul to the incredible grace of God. Peter's cry, and it's sometimes our cry too, is a claim on God's grace. Then comes this wonderful healing word. It's the word of trust. Peter, the liar, the coward, the deserter, is entrusted to feed Christ's sheep, to care for Christ's little lambs. Jesus was putting the work of God into the hands of one who had denied him. It is either an act of monumental foolishness or of magnificent confidence. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the scriptures remind us. We wouldn't do it, but God would. You see, God believes in us. God trusts us in spite of our doubts, in spite of our betrayals, in spite of our sin, God trusts us to care for each other. This question, do you love me, draws us out of our self-pity and self-despair and opens the windows of our souls 
bathes us with divine grace so that we can share the joy of our faith. God trusts us with the stewardship of this world in which we live and with all that's in it, God trusts us with the message of hope and salvation and redemption. He trusts us. It seems to me that in the strange and sometimes weird economy of God's kingdom, this is the act of revenge of Christ for all the words of denial and the acts of rejection. He takes his revenge by loving us and trusting us and coming again and again persistently to us even when we try to escape back to those simpler places and simpler times. Christ calls forth the confession of love from us and we are drawn from wallowing in our own sin and guilt to see a promised future that looks beyond ourselves to others and to the building of God's kingdom. My friends, our tomorrows, our tomorrows belong not to our failed and sinful pasts, but to our God's promised, graceful future. All Jesus asks is, do you love me? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.